All right. Let's go. Wee. <laughs> How are you guys? Good. Yeah, this that's very energetic. All right, let's try it again. How are you guys? Good. <laughs> very good. Um, all right, so I'm Pamela Fox, and today I was going to talk a bit about Backbone. How many of you guys have tried Backbone before? Cool. How many of you have successfully used it in a project? Okay. Not everyone. Uh, how many of you haven't tried Backbone? Okay, so cool. We're like half and half. Um, so I want to talk about Backbone because when I first tried Backbone, uh, I found it really just weird and crazy, and I also had never used an MVC framework, so this is like my exposure to MVC and JavaScript MVC all at once, and I was trying to port over an old app, um, but do it in the most backbone-y way possible. And I just like, it, I found it so hard that I was actually crying in the bathroom sometimes, going like, why, why is it so hard? Why isn't there any good documentation at all? Um, so because of that, uh, now that I've gotten my head around it, um, I think it's important to try and um, show other people what, what I learned about it so that hopefully you guys don't cry as much as I do. Uh, I probably cry more anyway, so it's cool, but a little bit less. Um, so I work for Coursera right now. Um, Coursera is online uh, university education. Have any of you attempted a class? Cool. Has anyone finished the class? Which one? Statistics. Okay, you can't remember. <laughs> cool. Um, so uh, yeah, so we do uh, online education, and we have a lot of different components of our site, and uh, we just have a lot of code. Um, so I did the count, and it's you know we've only been in existence less than a year, um, but we already have you know thirty thousand lines of code. Um, which is a lot of code, and we have a lot of functionality and a lot of different universities using this in different ways. And um, we have a, you know, a team size now of like maybe 10 or so on our front end team, right? Um, so that's a lot of code, and uh, if we didn't have any structure to it, it would just be all over the place, and honestly, a lot of it still is, because um, we still have our legacy code base. Um, Unfortunately, Coursera started as the, uh, the creation of a bunch of grad students that were just told to do it by their, their, uh, their research professor. And grad students that are told to do something by their research professor don't research, you know, they don't go to HTML5 conferences and research is the best way to structure their code so that it'll be maintainable and future-proof. They just do it, right? Because they've got homework to do, they've got other stuff to worry about, exams to study for, so they just write whatever code's gonna make it work. And then later, we become a startup, and there's actual users, and we look at our code and go, shit, what are we going to do? It's everywhere. So um, once actually Coursera turned into like a real thing, and we had real front-end engineers, we decided we needed more structure to our code. Um, so we decided to use a framework, um, and we went for Backbone. Um, you know, it was one of the, the first kind of frame, visible frameworks to come out. And it seemed to be lightweight enough where you know, we could work with it, right? So we use Backbone because it gives us a way to structure our code, right? We can split it out between the presentation and the view. It gives us modularity so that if we want to reuse something multiple times, we can do that. Um, it gives us that persistence layer. We have a lot of data. And then there's other stuff like the routing and the history and all that. Um, so this is a brief intro to Backbone. Um, so for those of you who haven't used Backbone yet, this should hopefully um, give you a basis in understanding it. So we've got models and views, and then, um, so here we have models, and we also have collections of models, and then we have views, and views usually output to the DOM, and then we can have routers as well that control which of the views to show. And all of these communicate with each other via events, right? A model might change and trigger an event, and the view might listen to that and decide to redo the DOM, uh, and all of that stuff, right? So here's a basic model. Uh, so if we were gonna model a book, um, so we'll define our model, we might give it some default for the properties we want, um, and we'll give it a URL, and the URL is so that Backbone knows um, how to actually get the data for the book from the server. So Backbone by default assumes a RESTful backend, it assumes this backend where you can do get, put, post, and delete to URLs, and then you'll get back the JSON and you'll send the JSON. Uh, so that's its default way of functioning. We'll see that that's not the only way you can use it, right? But that's what it wants. Um, and then we also have some 
function. So one of them is a function that just returns back uh, a, dis a display string, and the other one is a function that actually sets an attribute. So anytime you're changing the attributes, you actually need to use set and get. Um, and that's so Backbone can actually keep track of the fact that you're changing them so that it can trigger the right events and so that your views and your models and your collections can all listen to it, right? Um, there are other frameworks that you know, approach this data listening in other ways, like AngularJS has a different way of doing it, but this is a way that we do it in Backbone. So if I wanted to create a new book um, and I didn't want to fetch it from the server, I could just create a new book and pass in the properties that it expects. Uh, then we have collections, because it's really common that when you have one of something, you have lots of things. Um, so our collection, once again, we say what the URL is if we want to get it from the server, and we specify what the model is. So when it gets an array of JSON from the server, it looks at each item in that array and says, okay, I'm going to turn each of these into a book object, right? So you have your book collection of book objects, and if we wanted to create it without hitting up the server, we could do it like that, right? Set up our books and pass an array into the book collection. Um, so let's see how the back end works, right? So remember, we're defining our URLs. So if we create a new book and we give it an ID, Backbone will then look and say, okay, all right, so given that we have this URL and that ID, I'm just gonna do an HP get to slash API slash books slash 12, and then I'm gonna find out all about that book. So it expects your server to respond to that URL uh, with the JSON for that book. And that is the kind of RESTful API that it expects. Uh, and so that's what we want to get back there. Uh, and then once we have that book, we can we could mark it as owned, and then we could save, right? And if we saved, it would do a put instead of a post to that URL, sending the new JSON, and then your server needs to be ready to handle the, the new JSON of attributes. Ta-da. Um, so the same thing with collections, right? We create a new collection, we can get it, and this time we just get back an array of the JSON. Um, we, can all, we can create a new thing in the collection and it would do a post to that URL with the new thing and then create it. So that's the way it wants your backend to work. Um, so now if you've got your models and your collection set up, you'll typically want to visualize them. And the cool thing about doing WC, you know, obviously, is that you can have your models once, and you could actually have different views that show those models, right? Um, and that's kind of the powerful thing once you start separating your models and your views. Uh, we actually have models that we use across like five different apps, um, which all use them in different ways. But here's one way we might use our book, uh, our book models, right? So we might basically want to do a list of books. Um, so we'll have the book item view, and we can tell Backbone that the main, the root tag for that's going to be an li. We can give it a template. This one's using the underscore templates. You could use whatever templating system. You could use ghetto, inner HTML if you wanted. Um, and then we just render that model into it, right? Then we've got this view here, which is a book list view, and this actually is going to nest item views. So here, the, uh, oftentimes your views are associated with either a model or a collection, or maybe both. So this book list view is associated with a collection. It expects you to, to pass one in when you create it. Um, so an initialize, when it's constructed, it says, okay, every time that collection changes, you know, with the reset event, we're gonna re-render it, right? So this is very basic kind of data binding. Um, so when we, in that render function, we iterate through all the models in our collection, create a new book item view, append that when we render it, and then we have our thing. So this shows you can do nested views, you can do basic data binding. Backbone doesn't have as nice data binding as something like Knockout.js. Backbone, you really have to decide to listen to events and then figure out what you want to do if a model changes, but we don't have that like, strong like, attribute to DOM binding that we have in other frameworks. All right, and so finally we also have a router. Uh, and you don't have to use the router, some people don't, but if you do want to set up like a single page web app or you just want Backbone to be in charge of just figuring out what views to show, then you can use this router and Backbone will take care of all this URL stuff for you. So in the backbound, we'll have a, in the router, we'll have a list of URLs that map to, to view functions, and then a view function will create a view, pass in some collection, um, and then finally we can call backbound.history.start, and what that does, it checks the URL, figures out which of the views it's going to show, and then shows it. Um, so that's cool, it means that you can actually, uh, you can opt to actually use like real URLs, or you can use, um, like hashtag URLs or uh, HTML5 push date. So basically, you can tell it that if HTML5 push date is supported in the browser, 
it will use that. Um, and that means that your URLs will appear to change, but they're not really changing. It's just using this HTML5 push date API. And then it falls back to the, the hash approach, right? So you might have, you know, slash book list slash one in modern browsers. And then if you went to IE, you would see slash pound book list slash one, right? So that's cool because it means that we can manage all of our routing in JavaScript. Um, and uh, it actually works across all the, all the browsers, just in slightly different ways. Although I should warn you that making a single page web app is kind of crazy, because there's things you don't expect. Like you're used to window on unload, but if you have a single page web app, that unload event, it's not gonna happen, right? The window never unloads. So you have to come up, you, you can't think in the same way, because suddenly when you're doing a single page web app, you have like state in your routes, right? So something might be different depending on the, the way that you got to that route and where you were before, because you don't have these full page reloads. And so there's all this stuff that happens that you don't think about. So just get ready for that if you decide to do the single page web app route. Because you don't have to with Backbone, you could, you could not use this. Okay, so a few things about Backbone. It is integrated with jQuery if you want to, to use that to do you know, your DOM manipulation. Um, and everything has a, every view has a dollar L, which is the jQuery element associated with it. It's also uh, integrated with underscore if you want to do some operations on it. And uh, we use it at Coursera with Require.js and it works pretty well with that. And so Require.js gives us a way of managing our dependencies. So instead of us having to remember that we need to load this in that order and da da da, we just say for every single view or every single model, these are the dependencies for it. And Require.js will look and see, oh, have we loaded in yet? Oh, no, okay, let's load it in. And then when we deploy to production, we just run this script r.js, which comes up with a bundle that's optimized for our front page and says, okay, these are all the dependencies of the front page, as well as all the pages they're likely to go afterwards, right? Um, so that way we can, we, can, uh, we can feel confident in splitting up our JavaScript into lots of different files, knowing that we'll be able to bring them together later, right? Because that's sort of the concern, you're like, well, if I split it up into two different files, then I have to remember when to bring them in and what order to bring them in and yada, yada. Uh, but this way you can split it up into you know, hundreds of different files and know that with Require.js, you'll know when to bring it in. Okay, so that's the basics of Backbone. And so now I wanna talk about the different ways we use it at Coursera to give you guys an idea for how it is in the real world. Because the way it is in the docs is often very different from the way it is in the real world. Um, so we'll start with the first way. Um, well, actually, we have some common things that we use across all of our apps. Um, so we use it in different ways, but there's some things that are shared. So one thing we have is a custom router. We also have a custom region manager. Pretty much everybody, as does what I've heard, everybody that uses Backbone just makes their own region manager so that they can have uh, different regions of their page. So we have like the header, the main, the footer, and you don't want to swap out the whole thing all the time. Most of the time, you're just swapping out your main region, right? Um, and it's better for the user if you don't swap out the header, because if the header didn't change, why would you swap it out? So we have this region manager where we can say, right, just replace this part, just replace this part, or maybe replace all of it, right? Um, so we wrote our own, and I think most people have written their own, um, but people also use stuff like Marionette um, and uh, some other frameworks. Um, we also have a custom API layer, and um, this takes care of setting up a CSRF token. Um, you gotta, yeah, you gotta be really careful about CSRF tokens and have those be consistent. Um, and it also takes care of showing, uh, we just always show uh, loading messages at the top. Anytime we're doing an API call, we'll just always show a message at the top to let them know that something's loading. So we don't have to do that custom for every API call. It's always done. We have consistent tracking of when our APIs fail and all of that stuff. So let's look at three different front ends. So the first one is www.coursera.org. So this is the first front end we came up with. So you know our regions, we have our header up here. And this is our course catalog here. Um, and so if I click on this, you'll see the URL changed and the content changed. Um, but in fact, the, uh, the page didn't actually change. Um, it just looks like it changes, right? Uh, so every time we click here, this is just going to a backbone router and deciding to load something else, and the backbone router is using the push date to change URL. Uh, I thought this was really magical. Like, before I started working for Coursera, you know when you're about to work for somebody, you spend the weekend, like, viewing source on their website, trying to figure out what they do? Um, so as I was viewing source on the website, 
And I was also trying to debug errors that they had. You should never try to debug errors before you work for somebody, especially front-end, because it'll all be obfuscated JavaScript. And I was like, well, I've de-obfuscated your Jade templates, and I determined that the error is here. It's like, I should just get a life. Um, so if you look at our HTML, this is all you will see. It's pretty much just a bunch of meta tags. There's a div that we show in case nobody, if somebody doesn't have JavaScript, which still happens. And um, then we just load in our, our bundle, our require.js, and require.js will load in our compiled bundle of JavaScript. And at the very end, it says what the initial file is to call, and that's the routes file. So that's all of our page uh, is. There's, there's no actual HTML. So everything is built up in JavaScript, um, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> we do have, a lot of people ask, like, oh, how do we deal with Google and Facebook? Um, the way we, we deal with them is that we have a pre-renderer. So every time we deploy, our pre-renderer will go through and pre-render all of the pages and then create static versions of it. And then when Google or Facebook comes along, we're like, oh, here, here you go. And then it all looks like HTML. Um, so that ends up working pretty well. One day, you know, maybe Google and Facebook will learn to understand JavaScript. But I guess they have to hire more people. Um, so home. But this is what we call our home site. And um, so this was the first time that we used Backbone. And this is when we didn't have a proper API. Our API is literally returned HTML. Um, and so they weren't really set up in the way that Backbone expects, right? Not very structured at all. We would get the HTML, and then we you know, write the HTML into the page. This is back when we were handwriting the HTML for all of our course description pages, um, which doesn't really scale. <laughs> um, so uh, we, didn't, we couldn't really use it the, the way that Backbone expects. So instead, we do have models, but in our models, we don't define a URL. We just made up this function called sync. And sync is a function that we expect to be on all our models. And sync will go out and do the API call. And you know, if it's HTML, it'll figure out what to do with it. Um, and it'll just set the, the data of the model according to what gets back to the API. So we basically just came up with a convention that said, right, OK, we don't have proper APIs. Let's just make a sync method on every model. And that sync method will you know, have a success callback and an error callback. And that's the way it's going to work. So that's the point, is that you don't have to use Backbone the way it says to. You can go and use it a different way. Um, and the same thing with our collections. We define a retrieve. I don't really recommend calling functions retrieve, because then you have to remember i before e. And it's really hard. I mean, I'm good at that, right? But it's very hard for other people to remember i before e. So you should, you should pick functions that don't have um, ambiguous English spellings. Um, so we have retrieve. And that does the same thing. And then we have our views, and we split up our views. One of the things you'll try and figure out once you're doing Backbone is how do you split up your views? Because suddenly you'll have lots of files, right? And you know, it helps you to have a nice folder system. So for home, we split it up by some rough categorization. But categorization is really, really hard, right? That's one of the things you should always avoid having to do. Because like, I just sit there at night thinking like, how to properly put things into folders. And it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult, right? Sometimes I try to categorize our courses. And you, uh, you look at one, and you're like, well, maybe this is health and economics, or maybe it's policy. And it's really hard. So always avoid categorization. But unfortunately, we kind of have to do categorization when it comes to figuring out our folder structure, because folders are basically categories. We don't really have a tagging structure to file systems yet. Um, so that's one of the things you'll have to think about, is how to structure your, your files for ease of developer perusal. Um, so this is one example of a view catalog body. We have a template that we repeat over and over. Um, and then we have our router. So our router, um, in our router, we often check to see if the user is authenticated, because if they're not, we're going to punt them somewhere else. Um, sometimes we do a fetch for information before we open up the region, because um, we might want to punt them somewhere else. And then we have our crazy, complicated code for opening the region. But that basically just says, replace the body with the course records region. Uh, and then again, we finally start the history. OK, so that's dub dub. Um, so that was all cool, and I was like, huh, this is an interesting way of using Backbone, huh? Uh, but then uh, we had this task of making an admin interface. Basically, most of what we do is write admin interfaces. How many of you guys write admin interfaces? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of admin interfaces to everything on the web, huh? And nobody ever sees them, right? They only ever see the user facing stuff. So we needed to write this admin. Um, has anybody used Django admin? OK, so we had, so we um, run off Django for 
some of our code. Um, and uh, so we had Django admin, and this is what Django admin looks like, and it's this very structured way of, um, it just pulls in all of your models and does this auto discovery and co comes up with forms based on what's in the models and all of that stuff. Um, and it's cool, but it has a really icky way of interacting with JavaScript. Like you're literally writing JavaScript inside your Python, and, and then there's like CSS. It's, just, it's really, really gross, right? Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, we were using it at first, but then I kept on getting like feature requests to add this JavaScript widget and this JavaScript, and I, I couldn't take it anymore. I was like, no, this is disgusting. Like I refuse to put JavaScript in my Python anymore. This is it's just nasty. Because um, it also meant that I couldn't like use some of the logic we'd already built elsewhere because it was done in such a different way, right? So I was like, I really want to be able to extend this the same way that I extend everything else and not have this different way of doing JavaScript in one side part of the site. So I was disgusted, and um, I decided one weekend, Labor Day weekend, because that's a three-day weekend, always pick the three-day weekends to be your productive weekends. Uh, so I figured, all right, I'll just rewrite Django admin using Backbone. Um, so that was a fun weekend. Um, <laughs> and uh, it turns out Django admin does a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I still haven't managed to fully replicate it, but most people haven't caught on. Um, so I rewrote it. So this is, this is Django admin rewritten um, in Backbone. So what you see, we have the list, uh, the list view, and uh, then you know, we, can create, we can create new ones and we can edit ones. This is actually the live code and we have a lot of courses. Um, and uh, so you see here, we have all the, the form fields and all this stuff. So basically what I wanted for this admin was an easy way where I could just really easily, given the fact that we have so many different models in our database, just very easily create forms for them without having to go through a lot of work for each of them, and also be able to come up with custom form widgets quite easily as well, right? So I was basically making a form builder interface, um, which it turns out I've now counted in our code. We have 10 different form building interfaces. <laughs> um, so that's another thing that you might end up doing a lot if you do admin. How many of you guys have written a form builder? Yeah. One day we'll just solidify on one. Um, so that's basically what it was, right? Um, so the first thing I did was I found this thing called Jangbone, which was a little thing for Django that would output backbone uh, uh, put pose uh, get view requests um, that were kind of backbone friendly. And then I wrote all the backbone on top of it. Um, so we have models and they all extend a common model and that's something you can do is you know extend common models if you have things that are shared. So I have admin model. I also have staff admin model, which is extended by a few things. Um, and then each of the models define things that help me figure out how I'm going to uh, show them in the view. And some of you might look at this and say, wait a second, you are mixing your presentation and your data, because I've got stuff like whether there's in columns and stuff. Um, but whatever. <laughs> Look, I'm not perfect. <laughs> um, it works. I could have some like it, you know extra thing that said, okay, this is how we're. This is the metadata that's going to define how it's defined in these generic views. Because that's the thing. What I have is I have a bunch of generic views, or not a bunch. I have like two views that view all of the models. And those views will just look at the things that defines on the model to figure out how to display them. So they'll look at the columns, they'll look at the field sets, and they'll figure out what forms to build. Um, so one example, like staff admin model, so we have field sets, so we have a user, which is the attribute, and uh, you know, the attribute in the JSON, official title, universities, and they have different widgets, maybe it's a type uh, text, or maybe it's a select to widget, or a search autocomplete widget, and those are used to build up the form. Um, then we have our views, and it's really, um, there's a bunch of field views, but those are just the widgets in the form. The main view is just that model admin uh, page view, and that displays all the fields. Right, so that's that, right? So we have, this is once again an example of nested views, so we have our model admin page view, the fields view, and then each of the views inside of there, right? Um, and each of the views will communicate, or well basically the views are responsible for setting uh, data on the, on the fields, and so whenever data changes, I can actually trigger that save button to uh, become enabled, and then you'll know that you have to save, right? And you can even do auto save, but I do not implement that in this one. Um, and for saving, we're just following the standard backbone way of doing things, right? Everything is very backbone-y, very rusty. So when you start using backbone, you start like making words out of backbone, so there's like 
backbony, backbone-ish, backbonification. I was like totally backboning this weekend. There's a lot of different words that you can make up out of backbone, right? Um, but I think one day they'll be in the dictionary, right? It's like, wow, that was a totally backbony way of doing that. Um, so we also have collections, and similarly, those collections help us figure out how to show them. Um, and uh, they'll also have the URL for communicating with the server. And then we have basically just one collection view, right? So the cool thing is that once I've written this, anytime somebody asks me to add a new thing, all I have to do is define the, the model, and then all of these views will know how to show them, right? Um, so it means a lot less work for me, and it means whenever somebody has a new widget they want to use, like we've written five new widgets in the last week, and it's really easy. We plug them all in the same way, and it's all using our nice way of doing things. Um, and the router is pretty straightforward as well, right? Uh, it also, the router also looks at your permissions to figure out what collections it should show you at all. Um, but keep in mind, remember, that you shouldn't be enforcing your permissions just on the client. I mean, this is probably kind of obvious, but you should enforce your permissions on the client as well as the server, right? Or if you can propagate them from the server to the client. Because we have different things that different people are allowed to see, because TAs, instructors, university admins, super users, they all have different things they can see. Um, so we have ways of enforcing that both on the client and on the server. Sometimes if I need a really quick thing to do, I'll enforce it just on the client, and then the next day I'll go enforce it on the server. Um, but that was only on the launch day, so like at 5 a.m. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I would say something tricky about this is that, um, you know, I built it, and I didn't really know what people were going to use it for, because before we were just handwriting our thing in like Google Docs, right? And then I realized when we launched it that we, it was a collaborative editing interface and there were multiple people using it at once. You should know ahead of time if what you're building is a collaborative interface because it's obviously quite different <laughs> to make something that's collaborative um, because there's different concerns that come up, right? So what I did immediately, this was actually the 5 a.m. fix. The 5 a.m. fix was that I put in a bunch of protected fields on the API side which said, okay, you are not allowed to take this field from something to nothing. So that at least meant that we never deleted um, data that somebody else was putting in, right? So if somebody opened it and somebody else opened it and this one had nothing in at the time and then they filled it in and then this other person tried to save it and say, oh, sorry, this field went from something to nothing, that's bad. So that was the most basic thing I came up with. Um, but there's obviously a lot more advanced stuff you could do, right, is detect when the last person um, had actually entered the page or check when the model was last saved, all of that stuff. But just find, out, find that out ahead of time. Um, I also recommend another thing that I would have done from the beginning is not do real deletes because real deletes are really scary. Um, so I only put delete on a few models in our interface because that, that's very scary because it's actually doing a delete. What I should have done instead is on our models in the database, just put the deleted column and just set the deleted to zero or one based on whether you delete it. Because you never want to delete stuff. Like, it's, that's just too permanent. Um, so uh, that's, that's another thing I would have I done um, from the beginning. And then later on, I also added change logs. So you'll see, um, like on any of the uh, things we have here, we have a change log. And the change log shows everybody who edited. That's another thing that helps with the collaborative, the fact that it's a collaborative interface is we can see who edited when. And this was just a hook I put in the API. Every time something changes, I just record it in this change log, right? It's something that Django admin had from the beginning and da, da, da. So eventually I realized that people use Django admin for a reason is because there's a lot of really good stuff in it. Um, but the good thing about now that I've moved off it is that now we don't have to be dependent on Django. Because the thing is, like, our server side is always changing because our infrastructure team, like, they're like, oh, wait, Scala is the cool new thing. We're going to move to Scala. Um, so literally, we are moving to Scala. Um, so that's the thing. Like, we are going to be Scala in, like, two months, right? And so now for site admin to work on Scala, it's not that hard. We just have to rewrite the API. And I have tests for the API that just check, you know, get and, and responses, right? So we can, we can rewrite it in Scala. We can run the same tests against that Scala API. And then it should just work, right? I shouldn't have to change my front end at all. So that's why generally you'll see me try to use uh, JavaScript wherever I can, because that way I can just swap out that back end whenever we decide what the cool new back end is, right? 
I mean, they put a lot of effort and research. They even they talked to like Jeff Dean at Google, right? They they put a lot of research into figuring out what our back end is. Um, but that's a point, right? Like there's you know as you grow, you need to have different scaling concerns, and so your back end needs to change. Um, but your front end can stay JavaScript, hopefully, unless you're Twitter. Um, okay. So another way that um, we use Backbone is, is our course admin. So this is for um, the professors that are uploading all their content. They put a lot of effort into it. Um, this is, you know, there's tons of content they're uploading, lectures and quizzes and surveys and all that. And they want a way of figuring out how that's going to display to, their, to the students and when they're going to be visible and their open time and their published time and all of that. So we did this section manager here. Um, and as a general thing, one of the things that we try to do is like we'll identify a part of our website that desperately needs a UI overhaul, like the thing that's giving our students or our admins the most amount of trouble, and then we'll just completely rewrite it. Um, and we'll do it using a, often using a Backbone app. So everything else in the admin, if you click on it, it's actually uh, PHP rendered HTML. Um, but this right here, uh, is just taken over by a Backbone app, right? So that's the thing. You don't have to switch to using Backbone for every single part of your site. You can just identify where are the parts where we could really benefit from it and uh, where we, you know, we need kind of an, uh, an overhaul anyway, right? And you can just inject the Backbone app into just that part of the site, right? So that's kind of our plan on the front end team is we're just going to quietly inject Backbone, every, you know, and then one day, wee, it's all Backbone. Or it's all JavaScript. As long as it's just not PHP. Like our PHP was, like we had P, you know, when you have PHP where you have like var, you know, JavaScript variable equals quotes, PHP output right here. Like that's horrible, right? That's so hard to, if you want to move off PHP, it's so hard to, you know, um, move off of that. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is course admin. So course admin looks, Quite, uh, it works similarly to site admin, but one of the interesting things it does, which is also something that um, I, would, I would have done um, had I realized, is they do a partial update. So instead of doing a full put where you send the entire JSON, um, they take advantage of the fact that Backbone will keep track of the changed attributes and can, and can send only those changed attributes, and then they use what's uh, called an HTTP patch. Um, so that patch just sends those changed attributes, and then the API knows when it gets a patch that it's only going to update those attributes that changed, right? So that's a great way of making sure you don't accidentally override data that you didn't mean to override, right? Unfortunately, on site admin, I didn't realize how incredible, um, how much data I had access to in Django, and I accidentally overrode the student's attribute of a class, and I accidentally unenrolled 70,000 students. Um, Luckily, we had a backup, <laughs> but that's the thing. Like when you don't know um, what you're what you're overriding, if you do full full um, overrides, then you run that danger, right? Especially if you're using Django, which can do just crazy stuff with the relational data. It just reaches in and just clears out seventy thousand rows. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> so we do this partial update, and that just tells our API that it's going to use a patch instead of the put. Um, and another thing we do that's interesting here is we use a backbone relational model. And backbone relational model um, means that, because sometimes what you do is you, like, you'll, um, you'll get back JSON and you might have this JSON here and then it has a key. And then this JSON here actually corresponds to another model. So you actually ideally want this to become one model and this to become another model because these are basically you know, related models. So you can set them up using backbone relational. Um, so you say like, oh, it's a has many relation, the key is item, and the related model is the item model, and then it knows that it's going to go and um, create that uh, item model. Um, you do have to be careful about this sometimes, though, if you have, because unfortunately, we tried using this on our other site, but on our other site, on DubDub, we have a topics API, which returns back universities models, and then we have a universities API, which returns back topics, but it, we can't we can't have them both use backbone relational because when require.js tries to do the inclusions, uh, it can't do it because they're dependent on each other, right, like this. Um, so it can be a little tricky if you have APIs where you have kind of the, you're trying to support both APIs with reverse uh, relations. Um, but in this case, we were able to use it. Um, and I just want to show, I have six minutes, so I've started rewriting a, um, another thing in Backbone over the last like week. 
Um, and that's our forums. So right now our forums, they're rendered in PHP and they're done using this standard like, you know, reload the page. So if I was going to, well, I don't want to delete this as an actual post, but if I was going to edit the post or write a new post or all that stuff, after I did it, the entire page would reload. And um, I mean, it's fine, but it leads to a bunch of problems in user experience where we have to remember where they were and scroll them to the right point. And uh, you know, it's not a very fast experience for forms. You want forms to feel like it's easy to communicate in them. Um, and having to, to wait for everything to reload and get scrolled back down, that's a, kind of a bad experience. Um, and there are a lot of other things that were kind of suboptimal about our thing. The other thing is just that the API was not written in a way that was easy to add new features. So you can't actually edit comments because every API is written, and when I say API, I mean it in the loosest term of the word. Um, so every API is kind of written like, in, you know, it's, it's on it, in its own way. Um, so we don't have an edit comments API, even though we have an edit post API. So everybody just deletes their comment and then writes a new comment. So we have tons of deleted comments. So that's bad. So that's the other advantage of moving to an API centric approach, uh, where you know Jay is consuming and trying to have a RESTful API is that if you try and write your APIs in a consistent way on the back end, then it's usually easy to add in a new API, right? If you write all of your API in kind of a custom ad hoc way, then it can be kind of hard to add in something new. Right? So what I'm doing now is rewriting the APIs um, so that they're true APIs that take in JSON and output JSON and take in patch requests and all that stuff. And then rewriting it in, um, in Backbone. So this is the Backbone version. Um, and so when I edit, see it doesn't reload the page. I also jiggle the text. You see that little jiggle there? Here, I'll, I'll jiggle it again. Um, I'm trying to come up with a better animation for that. Oh, did I just delete it? Um, <laughs> in progress. Uh, so uh, luckily, this is my local server. But um, the point is that what I do here is that in Backbone, I just listen to the changed attributes, and then I just jiggle whatever changed. Right? So that's kind of something you can do, is listen to those changed attributes, decide only you're going to send those. Maybe you're only going to flash those, or you're going to decide how to re-render based on those changed attributes, stuff like that. Um, but the thing I'm, I, I'm struggling to figure out with this one is how I'm going to handle really long threads, because we have some threads that are uh, 1,000 posts long, and we obviously don't want to render those all in. So I'm going to have to do some incremental loading stuff. But anyway, you guys don't have to worry about that. That's my problem. Um, so that's an example. So I'm just going to replace only the uh, thread view, and I'm going to leave everything else about the forums the same for now. Um, and I'll just slowly um, replace stuff. And, but the cool thing is that now that I've written in Backbone, if I wanted to put threads somewhere else, like I really, really want threads to be tied to the lectures, but that was hard when they were like a full PHP page that was rendered out. But now that they're just a Backbone view, I could just go and say, right, let's just render this Backbone view next to a lecture, right? Or let's just render it next to a quiz or assignment. Like that should be easy, right? So I've gotten this uh, advantage of portability that I can use now. Um, so. Hopefully that shows you different ways that you can use Backbone and how you don't always have to pay attention to the real way of doing it, but there are some advantages to it. There's a lot of extensions to it. So if you're thinking of trying one, um, start off with a tutorial. Don't start off with the docs. The docs are not very friendly. The docs are a reference. They are not a guide. So once you know what function you're looking up, fine, look it up in the docs. But if you start at the docs and think they're going to teach you how to do it from scratch, you'll probably end up crying in the bathroom. Um, so I recommend the tutorial I linked to there. And then you know, maybe make a, an app from scratch or try porting one and try and do it in the backbone way at first and then see what kind of modifications you want to do. Um, but do uh, keep your options open. There's a lot of MVC frameworks out there. There's probably like five different ones represented here at HTML5TX. Um, uh, there's stuff like Enyo and Angular. Um, I spent the other weekend exploring Angular because I wanted to understand. Like every time you explore a framework, you get into the head of those people, and it's really, really interesting. Um, but then I ended up crying again, so um, <laughs> so I went back to Backbone. Um, <laughs> I mean, one thing that's important is not just picking the best framework, but also having a consistent way at your company of doing things. So look, maybe Backbone's not the best way, but we have this consistent way of doing stuff at Coursera now, and that's that's equally important, right? So it's a good enough way, and we have this consistent library, and we have all these things we've learned about it, and we can teach those to the new people who come on. So we're probably going to stick with it for a while now. 
Um, but that's the thing, you have to figure out what's important to you. Is it modularity, data binding? If it's data binding, back one may not be the best view. Is it testability? Is it the persistence model? There's lots of different things to look for in a framework. Um, and there's lots of different options, and there's entire conferences devoted to debating them now. Um, and you can always write your own, which is how all of those started, right? But it's really good to check them out and understand, you know, uh, what's in their head. Um, and that's all. Good luck. <laughs>